this is All Saints Day, uh, which is why all the ghouls and goblins were out last night. But the idea originally was just to make people aware of the supernatural dimension of the faith. Uh, and that, uh, that's why the readings today, of course, come about talking about the eternal state. And there's many more that we didn't read. I'm going to read another one in just a moment about how death is overcome in life in Christ. So, you know, it's like, uh, it's not really about pumpkins or uh, skeletons in the in the window or anything. It's about living forever in the presence of God. Amen. John 11, I'll just read just a, a, a bit here. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary that anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And therefore the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And uh, then, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the Lord delays a bit, and then he goes on. Um, and Lazarus, in the meantime, dies. And in verse 32, uh, when Mary comes down where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and say, see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Amen. And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you, you have heard me, and I know you have always heard me. But because of the people standing by, I said this, that they may believe you have sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Thank God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, last week I preached a sermon that's kind of uh, dense and full. Thank, uh, thank you all for uh, many notes that I've received about that, and I appreciate very much. I'm going to take just a few moments, and I'm going to tell some stories. And so this, this is not like uh, a kind of, uh, as much of kind of an intellectually intense message as it is a kind of a, a heart-forming kind of message. And I'm going to do it by telling just a few stories. The death of Lazarus, when we read about the death of Lazarus in the Gospel of John, we see a few things. Here's the things we see. One, Jesus slowed down and entered the story. Jesus deliberately did not go to uh, Mary and Martha and heal Lazarus. They knew that he had the ability to heal Lazarus, but Jesus did not go. How many has ever, have ever gone through a spell where you've prayed for the Lord to show up and it seemed like he was taking his good old time and getting there to you? Lord, we might say like the disciples did in the ship that time, Lord, do you not care that we perish? So Jesus slowed down into the story. The first part of the chapter tells us that Jesus did this. He, just, he waited until Lazarus had died. The second thing he did, he accepted the frustration of Martha and Mary as being a part of their reality. Martha was pretty strong. Well, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. They both say the same thing, but there's a little more attitude with the first one. And Jesus didn't say, you know what? You know who you're talking to? Uh, you know, I have my own ways of doing things. I did it the way I wanted it. He doesn't do any of that. He knows she's hurting, and he doesn't enter into an arguing with her or try to set her straight. He does, the same with Mary. When he meets Mary, he, she says to him the same thing. He doesn't respond to that. 
The third thing he does, he joins the mourners in their grief. Jesus knows what he's about to do, but he's hurt because of their hurt. They are grieving and he enters into their grief. Every once in a while, we'll have a funeral and, and someone will say to me, now, now, mama's at a better place and we're not gonna, nobody's gonna cry. There's not gonna be any of that kind of stuff. We're just gonna rejoice in the Lord because she's in a better place. And I always think, no, oh, trouble coming. Somebody doesn't know how to grieve. Paul said we don't grieve as others grieve, but he, don't, he didn't say we don't grieve. Uh, weeping does endure for the night. A joy does come in the morning, but there's weeping in the night. And when loved ones uh, are lost from us, we hurt. That's the nature of things. And Jesus shows this by entering into that grief. Jesus didn't say, why are you all crying? He's in a better place. He wept with them. Jesus wept. Shortest uh, verse in the Bible, by the way. If you ever want to memorize a verse, here's your opportunity <laughs> to memorize one. Then Jesus also completed the work of deliverance. Lazarus was down in a tomb. And when Jesus called to him with a loud voice, we don't know where Lazarus was, somewhere out there in some time and space we know very little about. Lazarus heard the voice of the Lord and he came out of the grave. But he did not come walking in, you know, nice suit of clothes. He was bound up like a mummy uh, in the grave clothes and he had to hop his way out there. And then Jesus was still with him and said, loose him and let him go free. I want you to know today that God may have touched you in your illness of soul and he may have delivered you and you may still be bound up in those clothes, but he hasn't left you. Just because everything didn't get transformed from just like it was before you entered the tomb does not mean that you have not been set free and made alive by the quickening power of the Lord. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him and stayed with him. Now, I thought about this because of a story that I heard last week uh, for uh, Archbishop Collini, which is a retired Archbishop uh, Anglican Church in Rwanda, and I was at a clergy retreat, and he was there, and he told this story, and I'm like, well, it really touched me. He said that before he was born, there was a, a man that was of uh, a limited uh, education and so forth, uh, that had heard the voice of the Lord say, go into the jungle and minister to the pygmy people. And he said in those days that was very dangerous because you could get diseases along the way. The people in the forest were not uh, always uh, uh, trusting and you know, could get hurt there. And, and it was a long, long way. It was a very arduous kind of thing. And this man went into the forest to minister to the pygmy people. And he established a work for the Lord there. And, and uh, Colini says that uh, when, uh, when he became a young minister, the old man took him with him. So he was going to go in and he said already, though 20 years had passed, uh, there were now roads It took them four days over very, very difficult roads to get back to where these folks were and to worship with them. And so along the way, he said, I'm young. And I look and I said, uh, I said uh, you know what? You're going, you need a helicopter. We're going to pray God's going to give you a helicopter so you don't have to put up with four days on this rugged road. And he said, this simple man looked at me like uh, just like horror struck. And he looked at me and he said, no, I don't want a helicopter. And so he had taken him seriously. So he just slowed down. And the man said to him, said, the Lord has deliberately slowed me down all this time. He said, so that I will meet the needs of the people along the way. As we go, people are coming out telling me folks that are dying, folks that need, uh, need attending to prayer. And he said, so this journey is a part of what I do. I don't want a helicopter. And so we were kind of chuckling. We weren't, it's like, yeah, it's a nice uh, uh, story from Africa. And then Colini, because he was talking to a group of people, many of whom have had to leave in the last few years, these very beautiful historic churches, and now they're meeting in malls and house churches. And he said to them, do you think that maybe God is not uh, with you like he is some of the brothers that pastor churches with really nice buildings and all of this? He said, Maybe God has deliberately slowed you down so that you will see the need of the people of this country, which is very, very great. 
And he said, when you get caught up in the kind of church work that's like helicopter work, catapulting over, then he said, you will miss out on what God wants you to do. We, one of the major doctrines of our faith is called the, the doctrine of the incarnation. It's a word that means enfleshment, putting on flesh. And it just means that God became a man. He didn't just put on a God suit like a Halloween costume, a man suit. He became a human being. And this story is one th that shows that. He wept uh, because he felt the need he was a human being. And so God became a man, and we, we talk about that in Advent, which we'll, we will enter into in just a, a few uh, short weeks. We talk a lot about the doctrine of the incarnation, God becoming a man. But what does it mean? It means God coming into our story, in, into where we are. Uh, Jen, as I was talking about that this week, she reminded me of a little known verse, or, uh, rarely sung now, from Charles Wesley's uh, Carol, come thou long expected Jesus. Come thou long expected Jesus. Come to earth to taste our sadness. Come to earth to taste our sadness. He whose glories knew no end. By his life he brings us gladness. Our redeemer, shepherd, and friend. Leaving riches without number. Born within a cattle stall. This the everlasting wonder, Christ was born, the Lord of all. It may be that my favorite Christmas carol is uh, be, uh, Bleak Midwinter, which is uh, very rarely sung either. But it has the same idea. In the bleak midwinter, uh, when hoary winds made moan, uh, uh, and about the ice and the snow and so forth. It was in that world that, that Christ came. So we find then here a principle. Pity is concern from a distance, but compassion is about entering into the pain of another. Pity is concern from a distance, but compassion is entering into the pain of another. I began to think about this and the implications of it after I had had, well, after I had met a man by the name of Nicky Gumbel, one of the people who have really influenced me in life. He is the pastor of Holy Trinity Brompton in London, and, uh, and, and it was from that church that we got the Alpha series that some of you know something about that's millions and millions of people have gone through and found Christ. Nikki came to our church in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was about done with charismatics because I had seen so much kind of junk that I'm like, you know, I, I know I met the Lord in Pentecostal church and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and I believe it all, but I tell you what, I've seen an awful lot of stuff that made me want to run the other way. And that's kind of where I was. And then Nikki came to our church and Nikki, Nikki um, is uh, a friend of Prince Charles. He has his doctorate in theology and doctorate in jurisprudence, one from Cambridge, one from Harvard. He's a really big deal in England. And so like, cool. So he was using our church to put on this, um, uh, this seminar for the Alpha Seminar. And it was maybe 300 or so um, pastors of, of the more left of center kind of mainline Protestant ilk. And Nikki keeps presenting this, and very kind, and folks keep kind of asking him questions that they're suspicious and they're not quite liking what he's doing somewhat. And then he gets to the part where we introduce people to the Holy Spirit. And Nikki said, well, it's easy, you know, uh, you, you just ask the Lord to come. And so someone says, well, what if nothing happens? He said, well, then you don't do anything. He said, that's when you get in trouble is when you stir up something that God didn't do. He said, no, you don't do anything. So I'm listening. And he said, do you want a demonstration? And they were like, yeah. So he said, is there anybody here that has some pain in your life that it seemed like God has never really addressed? If Jesus Christ had really risen from the dead and he's alive and working in the world today, he would address in some way. If there's anybody like that, would you stand? Well, there was this a lady Presbyterian pastor that given him heck for all kinds of really kind of pointed questions and everything. And she stood. 
So Nikki stood back like this from the pulpit and he said, come Holy Spirit. And he bowed like that and she fell on the floor. Bam. And when he said, well, this happens sometimes. She's okay. She's all right. Let's just uh, let that be. Lord will do what he wants to with her. Suddenly some man began to weep over here and then somebody else was falling on their knees over there. And suddenly, just like in churches and camp meetings I had known all my life, the place was filled with the glory of God. But the man on the stage was doing nothing. The lights hadn't dimmed. The organ wasn't playing. The big choir wasn't singing. So I'm like, somebody didn't teach these people how to do this stuff. And then I realized our world today has seen so much manipulation that they must see this kind of God at work in ways that are not humanly directed and manipulated. And I was interested, so I wanted to know what had gone on in his life. Well, I, I don't have enough time to go through the whole story, but he had met in his life 20 years before a man by the name of John Wimber, who was the uh, founder of the Vineyard Movement. Now, John Wimber was another issue because the John Wimber was a member of the Righteous Brothers, you know, back at, some of you old enough to remember them, and he was a Quaker, and, um, and so he had come into the Jesus movement, and, you know, he was trying to figure out about the Christian stuff, and he was really interested in healing, and he felt like that God called him to pray for the sick, but he prayed for the sick every uh, week faithfully, and for three years, nobody was healed, and he decided, well, I'm just going to keep praying for the sick I, you know, I'm just, uh, because God's asked me to do that, and that's what he was doing. But in the meantime, he had been going to these really big uh, prayer meetings, these great uh, prayer revival meetings and crusade kinds of uh, uh, stadiums and so forth. And he saw God at work, but he felt something was seriously wrong. And what he thought was wrong was that the, uh, that the, it was uh, centered around a, a, a kind of a leader as celebrity and the person was in the center and in control and everyone was looking at that person and that person was kind of directing everything and, and, and everybody was looking at him and, that, uh, uh, and Wimber thought, this isn't right, this isn't consistent with, with, uh, with Jesus. And at the same time, he had come under the influence of George Elton Ladd, which is evangelical theologian, and his work on biblical prophecy. I want to tell you how these two things come together, how they connect to this wonderful song that John just sang in the scripture from Revelation, and how this all comes together. George Elton Ladd taught that when Jesus Christ was here, that one of the major themes of the Bible is, uh, is the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus was here on the earth in the flesh, the kingdom of God was fully present. Wherever Jesus was, you know, dead people couldn't stay dead and sick people couldn't stay sick. Jesus was like a very disruptive force in, in, the, in the world of uh, fallen creatures and, and, and the spirits of darkness and so forth. Wherever he went, things like got messed up because, uh, because the, whole, the kingdom of God was fully present in a human being, right? As we see here with he calls Lazarus uh, uh, out, out of the tomb because in the kingdom, uh, you know, people are not going to die. They're going to live forever. Uh, and, and, and that was happening around Jesus. And then Jesus said to us that the kingdom of God is within us and the kingdom of God is among us. So why is this stuff not happening with us? That was the question. And, and uh, so uh, George Elton Ladd came to the conclusion that Jesus was a foretaste of the coming kingdom and he is with us, but we're still fallen creatures and we're living in a fallen world. And so when we pray for the sick or when, uh, uh, when we are asking God for guidance or so forth, then the, then the power and the presence of God is among us and is not always as fully realized as it was in Jesus. In fact, it rarely is. So that when we pray for somebody for a miracle, we do not always see that instantaneous miracle. Sometimes we see people uh, have a gradual uh, healing or we see someone helped or we see that suddenly they, they feel the presence of God and they're comforted in their illness and that we're supposed to just kind of give up what kind of the outcomes, that's in God's hands, but we are to pray for the sick and to believe that the kingdom of God is among us. So Wimber began to put these things together and he had some practical outcomes that were very strange to those of us in the Pentecostal movement. 
And he wa- he, here was the deal. He said, when you pray for the sick, you're not supposed to be a guru. You're not supposed to mystify people. You're not supposed to glow in the dark, walk on water, or fire shoot out of your hands or any of that stuff. That would be really cool. And I'm trying. I have been trying. I can't even levitate, and that's something that I've wanted to do. I, I miss that in seminary. So, uh, so you know, we, we, we just have to work with what we've got. But Wimber says... The person who is praying for the sick is in the same situation as the sick person. Namely, that we're fallen creatures, mortal creatures in a fallen world. And that we are the partner of that person to help them find Jesus, to take them to the presence of Jesus. So Wimber said, he used this example and it kind of stuck out to me in his book, Power Healing. He said, if you are with somebody and suddenly, you know, Uh, your feet start burning and they weren't burning before, stop and ask the person if there's something wrong with their feet. And he said, they will say yes or no. If they will say yes, they probably will say something like, well, yes, wow, how did, why did you ask? Don't mystify and don't say, well, because I hate to put it this way, but I have a gift and uh, no, just say I'm stumbling. But I sometimes when I'm praying for someone, the Lord begins to give me a feeling or a physical sensation somehow related to what they're dealing with, and that's happening to me right now. Tell me about what's going with me. So you're taken away. I, I'm stumbling here just like you. And if they say no, they're not going to be offended because the same answer. You're not telling them, uh, well, you, you must not be right because I have that no. Or something's going to get wrong with your feet. You know, try to cover you. Don't do that. Just you're, you, it is a kind of a sanctified guessing in the presence of God together with someone. And we're going to have prayer for the sick in just a moment and, and for all kinds of things, whatever your needs are. And I wanted to tell the people, when you're praying for folks, enter into their situation. One thing that Wimber said in the book, Power Healing, that stuck, struck with me, he said, despite the name of the book, he said, the healing of Jesus was not basically, was not mostly based on power. It was not so much as a demonstration of power. And when we get into that, we're wanting to impress people with demonstrations of power. He said over and over, the gospel writer says, and Jesus moved with compassion. He was touched. That's the basis on which we pray for others. Let me end with this. Connected to that, I think, is something I heard not long ago with about the way that uh, some of the Eastern Orthodox priests hear confession. You know, in Roman Catholic circles, if you go to confession, then the priest will, um, will say that he absolves you by the authority that he believes is conveyed to him in, in ordination uh, in the name of the Lord. In the Anglican order, this is, uh, this is, of course, a Protestant take on it. It's, it's like I am called to pronounce forgiveness of sins because the Lord, uh, the Lord has accomplished that for us. And as a brother or sister in Christ, I'm telling you, assuredly, your sins are forgiven. But in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, at least the person talking to me about this said that the priest and the penitent go to the altar together and face the altar, not one another. And the priest begins with this, Lord, you know that I am a notorious sinner, both in the things I do and the things I do not do. The thoughts of my heart are grievous to you, and you know that there are many things in me that's not like you, and that I suffer because of my sin. And I have come today with my brother and my sister, who also burdened by their sin, and I pray that you would now hear their prayer and give them the grace to confess. And then the priest says, to the extent it's helpful to you, whatever details you may want to give or generalize whatever, talk to the Lord. And when it's all over, the priest says, Lord, we we sinners have come with assurance that we have been forgiven of our sins. That seems to me to be the spirit in which we proceed. And believing as we do as Protestant people that all God's people are priests, We all have the power and responsibility to do this.
As people come forward today for prayer, maybe they, sometimes it's, it's heartbreaking someone will lean over and say something um, haltingly with a lot of shame. I'm addicted to prescription drugs. I don't know how to get free. So what do you do when you hear something like that? Oh, really? Well, it's bad. Let me fix this for you. Let me, no. You say, well, maybe if you're praying for someone, you've never been addicted to prescription drugs. But can you pass up that second helping of cake? And is that not addiction? It may be less harmful, but not in the long run to you physically, probably. Don't we all know what it means to have habits we cannot break that aggravate us and harm us and make us feel a sense of suffering? Someone comes to you and says, I have a problem with pornography. Well, let me just tell you, if you breathe air then you understand the power of nudity and sexual images and the grip that that can have on the imagination and the desire. And there is no sense pretending that you're so high and holy that you would, well, I would never, oh my God, you know, we missed that. Enter into compassion because the person has come wanting to touch the Lord with their infirmity of soul. We know what illness is. We've been sick. We may not have had cancer, but we may have had a loved one that has had cancer, or we may have some other sickness that we, some chronic deal, and we know what it's like for people to live with this kind of thing. Enter in. Don't try to fix. Don't try to be a guru. But as we pray today, I wanted this to be a kind of a show and tell. As you come forward for prayer today, I want this to be as much about the prayer workers as about the people who come up. I would like for you to ask the Lord to help you be a prayer partner with the people today and enter into their distress. And if it takes time, it takes time. And I deputize anybody else out there, you're not an official prayer, you are a prayer today. Do you breathe air? (laughs) Have you accepted Jesus as your savior? You're hereby deputized. You are now a prayer. (laughs) Say, I don't know how to pray. Well, Paul said he didn't know how to pray either. He had to always have the Holy Spirit to help him to pray because he didn't know how to pray. Didn't he say that? I want us to enter into that today. And as we do, here's the thing about it. Our church needs to be open to all the spiritual gifts. And I think a reason why sometimes the church is reluctant to be open to the spiritual gifts is because we've met the kind of uh, the um, demonstration of spiritual gifts in pushy, manipulative, controlling ways, sometimes exhibitionist ways. Thus say I unto you, God wants you to give me your money or whatever, you know. And we're like, then you're like, oh, is that God? I don't know. I don't, I don't have much money, but if God wants me to sign the check in faith. And you're like, oh, God, well, maybe, you know. So we're kind of put, <laughs> didn't mean to startle you. Just go with it. Go with it. We're fallen creatures. Go with it. But, you know, so many times like, no, we don't want anything to do with stuff like that. But that's not God's way anyway. We're all fallen people, but we're God's people. And we can enter in. And if an oppression comes to you, the only thing you have to do is ask permission. It's like I had impression as I'm praying with you, wow, about... Uh, some sense of pain in your life that I, and is that correct? And, and, and then you, you know, you can go with it and, you know, somebody might say, well, that's just kind of guessing, but we see through a glass darkly, but seeing through a glass darkly doesn't mean we don't see. We see something. The man that was touched by the Lord saw trees, men as trees walking, but didn't mean he didn't see at all. The Lord had to touch him again. And so I want us to learn how to enter in that place of compassion. And here's the final thing. A lot of times in backgrounds where we prayed a lot for the sick, we think, well, I have to get holy enough and I have to be really prayed up and I have to really, no, you know, you need to do that anyway. But uh, to be used of God, 
you just need to know that the Lord wants to show up and, and help people. So many times when I come up here to preach, I'm thinking, man, I just wish I could, I could get my own life as the way I wish it to be. But the fact is then when God uses me, then I stand back and I'm amazed as anybody else. And, and I know the, the, that the thing about it is that when, when good things come through me, they didn't come from me, they came through me. And we can all do that. We can all be the hands and feet of the Lord in this way. So I want our prayer... Uh, uh, folks to come up if you will right now and just stand here and I'm going to pray over you and um, and I would like for you to be kind of uh, sensitive to as we continue to pray that if the Lord touches you with a word of encouragement for somebody across the aisle everybody you look at a certain person and a scripture keeps coming to you don't go, go to them and say God told me to tell you that Isaiah 3, 6 is a verse for you. Give that up. You don't know that. What you do know is that you have an impression that you'd like to share and say, you know, I hope this is helpful to you, but when I've been looking at you today, this scripture keeps coming and offer it to them. Nobody's upset with that. And if they turn to it and they say, oh, that's it. That's the answer. I was waiting for the Lord. Then guess who's going to rejoice? They're going to rejoice. You're going to rejoice. They know it. It came through you, not from you. You're both giving honor to God for what God has accomplished. Are you ready for some of this today? Lord, thank you for this uh, wonderful time we have in your presence right now. And I'm praying, Lord, that you would touch our prayer workers today with faith, a word of knowledge. And I pray that we would all be delivered from thinking about if I was more perfect or if I was this, I could, I could be a conduit. Like, I pray you'll deliver us from all that and realize you just want to touch people in your name. You want to come among us. So we ask you now, Holy Spirit, come among us. Do the work that you've always been doing, and that is undoing the work of the enemy in our lives and bringing us a sense of your presence, healing and delivering in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's go to the throne of grace. If you are wounded And if you're alone If you are angry and If your heart is cold as stone Or if you have fallen If you are weak, then come find the worth of God that only the suffering seek. Come lift up your sorrow and offer. You are.
here and uh, I'd like to just invite you to experiment with something. I'd like for you to see if in their, your heart there's something you'd like the Lord to address today in your life. It doesn't have to be a sin. It can be also some aspiration that you want to, some vocational aspiration or something you've wanted to do in ministry that you have seemed to weigh as blocked. You have some just unfulfilled stuff going on there. You have a situation with a loved one. And I'm wondering if uh, you would just risk, take a moment, think about what that might be, and find someone, doesn't have to be the person next to you, though it can be, and just go to someone right now. And if you're comfortable, tell them what it is. If you're not comfortable, that's fine. And just ask them to pray for you. And as you are praying with that person, and you, you, of course, you'll have one of your own, you'll want to take it to someone else. When, when some, you're praying with someone, see if anything comes to you. If you've got a verse of scripture, you just have a particular line of prayer that feels like God's taking you in. And, uh, and just, just, let, just experiment with that kind of holy intuition and just letting the Lord guide you in your prayer or in what that you want to say to that person. Lord, help us with this right now because even though it's important here in this sanctuary, it's even more important out where we work, more important with unbelievers, that we are able to 
hear from you and to sense what you would have us to say to people and to pray with people about. So we pray, O oh Lord, you would teach us that now, Lord, as we are hearing your voice about turning outward from ourselves to the neighborhood around us. This is one of the most important tools we can have, and that is to be clothed by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, grounded in compassion. Now we pray now, Lord, that you would help us with this time of prayer. Guide us, as Paul says, when we don't know how to pray as we should, the Spirit himself prays through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just feel free to go to somebody right now. are open and as they continue praying we're going to just sing this song together it's called compassion hymn and every word is what we long to be as a church and kind of how we want to leave this place so would you sing this with us to rescue the 
a few closing words. I want to announce to you a couple things, what Christ Church believes and teaches. The next intensive weekend is coming up November 13th and 14th. You can find out more information on our website and sign up there. We also have an exciting concert coming up at the end of the month, the Gerald Wolfe's Gospel Hymn Sing. It's going to be here November 20th at 7 p.m. Lots of Southern Gospel groups, Greater Vision, Mark Trammell Quartet, Jim Brady Trio, Taranda Green, Stan Whitmire, Mylon Hayes Family, and our Christchurch Choir. It's going to be a good, fun, old-fashioned hymn singing. You can get tickets beginning tomorrow at our in our bookstore, so the next couple Sundays, but most easily you can buy them online on our website on one of the banners. It's about 
about this event. So you can get tickets there. We have both of our prayer um, services this week on the first Tuesday prayer service. Check it out. It's on the calendar, 7 p.m. We also have Pastor Dan's healing prayer service this coming Saturday. And finally, a word about prayer. Our prayer calendar for Thanks and Giving Month for the month of November is out. So you can pick up a copy of the prayer calendar at the Connect Station and also be watching on social media, Twitter, Facebook. All throughout the month of November, we'll have a daily prayer emphasis. So we ask that you would pray with us. Well, if you are here this morning, as Pastor Colleen said, and you're visiting with us, go go meet someone at the Connect with Christ Church station. They've got a gift for you. And if you're here this morning and you have never come to that point in life where you've said, yeah, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Or maybe if you're just exploring, what in the world does that even mean? There is a team every week at the Exploring the Christian Faith station in the foyer ready to pray with you, ready to speak with you today. So go speak with them this morning. And now let's all stand as we bless one another with our benediction song. God be with you. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide uphold you. With his sheep securely God be with you till we meet again. Go in peace and serve the Lord.